so you have to. I guess maybe you don't have to re accept that. Okay, good. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'm in McGraw Hill Connect. And here I am going to show you practice midterm two. Okay. And uh, as I said at the beginning here, um, these questions are primarily coming from chapter uh, eight and nine, dealing with audit sampling, a little bit from some of the other areas, but primarily chapter eight and nine. And I selected questions from these chapters because I know that many students sometimes struggle a little bit with how to deal with audit sampling. And I think it's because you see the word sampling and you think I'm going to be asking you, you know, these detailed numeric questions dealing with statistical sampling and whatnot. And the reality is that I'm just seeing if you know the terminology and if you see how various factors affect sample size. That's the main two things that I'm going to be asking about. Okay. Now, um, some of these things really kind of go back to some things that we had studied in earlier chapters, but let's just review some of these. Not a bad idea for us to review this. And I guess I can make some of this a little bigger. Hopefully that's uh, adequate for you to see on the screen. And we say management philosophy and operating style most likely would have a significant influence on an entity's control environment. And you can see if it is dominated by one individual. So you have one dominating manager, that one dominating manager is overriding the controls that would uh, have an effect on the entity's environment because the control environment, remember, of the different components of internal control, control environment. We have our, what, our risk assessment. We have our uh, control procedures that we put in place. We then um, go ahead and uh, communicate those control procedures, and then we monitor, right? And then that feeds in the control environment that comes from the top of the organization, and that cycle repeats. You can almost see that as a circle. Well, obviously, if we have one person dominating management because the control environment sits at the top and touches all the other components of the control, uh, that would um, be something that obviously would affect the environment because it's at the top of the organization if we're talking about single a dominating manager. Okay, stop me if there's questions, guys. Taking a look, proper segregation of duty. Remember, we segregate what? Authorization, record keeping, and custody. Okay, transactions should be authorized by one individual. The actual accounting or record keeping should be done by a separate individual. And then finally, um, we should have uh, custody of the particular asset, whatever being handled by a third person. Sometimes in an automated environment, you might be able to combine authorization record keeping because computers don't buy product for themselves and take it home. So you could combine some of those in an automated environment. And then obviously, if you have a smaller entity, you may not see as sophisticated controls. But uh, from a theoretical standpoint anyway, these three functions should be separated. Now, the other important thing about looking at these three functions is when we talk about the responsibilities of various departments, we are essentially trying to separate these duties. So if we talk about, for example, in a later chapter, we'll get into human resources. And we have what? We have the human re um, into payroll. We have what? The human resources department hire somebody the supervisor has what? The, they have the authorization to hire. The supervisor has the authorization to direct the activities. We would separate what? The accounting from the payroll from the distribution of checks so that we have a separation between the record keeping for the payroll and the custody of the asset, which would be the payroll checks. Taking a look, a flow chart is most frequently used by an auditor in connection with, and we would use a flow chart for a more complicated system. There's really three ways to document. Remember when we talked about internal control, we said the auditor is responsible to document their understanding of internal control. The different ways to um, document the internal control, one is to a flow chart. The other would be through some sort of a cycle memo, a write-up of the internal control, which is a narrative. Another way would be to use documentation from the client. Of course, we would need to review that to make sure that that documentation is um, adequate. Okay, so what happens? 
when we have these different ways of documenting, if we have a particularly um, uh, complex internal control system, accounting system, then we would go ahead and use a flow chart approach. Taking a look at uh, this question, which of the following audit tests would be regarded as a test of controls? And let's look at some of these others. Test of specific items making up an account balance. Well, that's a substantive test, right? Uh, test comparing inventory pricing to vendors' invoices. Again, a substantive test. So substantive tests are testing numbers embedded in the financial statements, embodied in the financial statements. Those are substantive tests. Test of additions to property, plant, and equipment by physical inspection. Those are all substantive tests. Test of signatures on canceled checks to the board of directors authorizations. Yeah, that's a control. The board of directors have to authorize certain transactions, maybe over a certain dollar amount. And we would look to see uh, that indeed that control had been applied. That's a test of controls. Okay, So we test what? We test controls. If we believe that we can lower our risk of material misstatement to less than the maximum, our control risk is less than the maximum, we would then be required to test the operating effectiveness of the controls. We always have to do what? Some amount of substantive tests. We don't have to test controls if we believe that the controls do not have operating effectiveness, of course, because um, there's no reason to test ineffective controls. That, however, would mean what? we'd have to be doing more of the substantive testing of the nature of some of the things that you see listed in this question. Okay, uh, an auditor's primary consideration when we're looking at an entity's internal controls is are the financial statement assertions fairly stated? So remember, I showed you that uh, example where we looked at the sales account and the account receivable related account. We asked ourselves what could go wrong. We came in with a potential misstatement, and then we looked for internal controls that would prevent or detect the misstatement, but we did that by assertion. In the example, we were looking at the existence assertion, and I looked at controls that would help to prevent or detect the misstatement in the, uh, in the uh, existence assertion. And in the bottom part of that chart I gave you in that example, I said, well, look, if the control is seen to potentially have operating effectiveness, then we will test the operating effectiveness of the controls. And then we do a substantive procedure that lines up with that assertion. And in that case, I was talking about confirmation of accounts receivable, which is the classic assertion for um, the uh, existence assertion. And so I go through and I look at that. And um, we went and did substantive tests with the confirmation. So you always have to do the um, substantive testing, but you look for controls that will prevent or detect the misstatement uh, in that particular assertion. Um, the rest of these, um, you know, you may be concerned about these, but the auditor's primary focus is on the assertion. So the key word there was primary. Okay, good. Now, this is now getting really into the chapter eight, chapter nine material, which is going to be the primary focus of our discussion here tonight as we look at these um, you know, potential exam questions. Okay, so the risk of incorrect acceptance, what is that? Risk of incorrect acceptance is the risk that the auditor will say that the financial statements are materially misstated. Ah. Said that backwards. The risk of incorrect acceptance is the risk that the auditor will determine that there um, is not a material misstatement in the financial statements. In other words, we'll issue what an unqualified, unmodified opinion when in fact there is a misstatement in the financial statements. And that obviously has to do with what the effectiveness of the audit. That's audit failure. If there was a material misstatement and you didn't modify your opinion appropriately, you gave the wrong opinion. You should have given a qualified opinion. You gave an unmodified, unqualified opinion. You have audit failure. Okay, and that's the risk of incorrect acceptance. We want to avoid that, right? Coming over, looking at the next question, which of the following audit tests would an auditor most likely use attribute sampling? Remember, attribute sampling is used for what? test of controls. We're looking for an attribute. We're looking for the sign-off 
on those checks, for example, from the board of directors. We're looking for the sign off on the uh, time card of the employee from the supervisor. The attribute we're looking for is the signature. We're looking for the sign off on credit approval for a particular sales invoice, whatever it is. Okay, we're looking for that particular attribute. And so when you look at the first three here, these first three, they're the wrong answer. They're all substantive tests. They are all getting us to the dollar balance embedded in these accounts. Inspecting employee time cards for authorization for the supervisor. Yeah, for a signature for the authorization, that is an example of a control test. And for control tests, we use attribute sampling. Coming over, in addition to evaluating the frequency of deviations in test of controls, deviation is when we say that there's a particular control that is supposed to be applied. The supervisor is supposed to tie a sign off on the time card. So the deviation would be what? Supervisor didn't sign off on the time card. We don't see the signature there, right? Um, but we'd also consider um, qualitative aspects. And an example of qualitative aspects here is what? If the auditor saw that there was some sort of um, deviation, but it was initially concealed by a forged document, now my what? Now my fraud considerations are coming into play. And I'm probably going to want to do something that's going to allow me to get a better sense as to whether the control is being um, being um, circumvented somehow. Um, I probably will want to expand some of my substantive testing and whatnot uh, if I start to discover these sort of things. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, number nine here, an auditor plans to examine a sample of 20 checks for counter signatures as prescribed in the entity's internal control procedures. One of the checks is the chosen sample 20 cannot be found. The auditor should consider the reason of this limitation. And so we're looking for checks. We're looking for the control, the signature. If you can't find the check, can you look to see the signatures there? I mean, what are you going to ask the company? Hey, we're missing this check. And they're going to say, oh, well, that one was signed. No. If you can inspect a document to see that the control was applied to perform your internal control attribute sampling, you treat that as a deviation to say, if I don't see it, then the control didn't happen. If the evidence isn't here in front of me, then it didn't happen. Treat it as a deviation. Number 10, as a result of test of controls, an auditor incorrectly assess control risk to a, a low. So what happened? We can assess control risk too low. We can assess control risk too high. Now, if we assess control risk too high, what are we going to do? Then the timing, extent, and nature of our substantive procedures are going to be that we're going to use external evidence. We're going to be using more effective audit procedures. Um, so the nature, external evidence, more effective um, uh, tests, which means I'm probably going to be using uh, external evidence instead of internal evidence. And the timing, I'm probably going to do my testing. At, um, so that would be nature. Nature is more effective procedure using external evidence. Extent, I'll probably use larger sample sizes for my testing and for my substantive testing. And timing, uh, I'm going to probably do my auditing at year end. Now, remember, we said that if you do that, then what? Then you probably have not been very efficient in how you've gone about it because you've got the best evidence, the most reliable evidence to support your opinion. Meanwhile, you had some controls that were probably effective um, in preventing or detecting the misstatement. So you assess control risk too high. Your audit is therefore what? Not going to be, um, uh, uh, if we, in that case, would assess control risks too high, okay, and our audit will not be effective. Now, as a result of controls and auditor incorrectly assess control risk too low, and decrease substantive testing. So what's happened now? Now we said, well, our control risk is low. We thought we had controls that would prevent or detect the misstatement. We looked at the time cards. We looked at 100 time cards. We saw that all 100 were signed. But when we pulled the sample, we got a non-representative sample. If we had looked at all the time cards, we would have found that half the time the supervisor didn't sign them. So we have assessed control risk too low. We lowered the amount of our substantive testing. That means that what? 
that means that the uh, true deviation rate in the population was more than the deviation rate in the sample. Sample indicated to us there were no errors, there were no deviations. Meanwhile, if we had looked at the population, we would have found that the supervisor wasn't doing a good job. We would have assessed our control risk higher. Here we assessed it now too low. And so uh, as a result, we are now not going to do enough substantive testing and there's a chance that we won't detect a misstatement. Stop me if there's a question again. Number 11, an auditor uses statistical sampling for attribute and testing controls. It most likely is, uh, it, it, the auditor is most likely to reduce the plan reliance on the prescribed control when, and again, terminology, right? The sample deviation, rate of deviation, plus the allowance for sampling risk exceeds the tolerable deviation rate. So just to use some numbers on that, our, um, our tolerable deviation rate was say 3%. And we said, we're willing to set, we look at hundred time cards, we'll accept three times when the supervisor doesn't sign the time card. It's at 3%. Now what happens? We go through 100 time cards and we find one deviation. Well, that's the what sample deviation rate. That's 1%. We're looking at a sample of 100. Maybe they have 10,000 time cards. We're looking at a sample of 100. We find one deviation. That's 1%. But then we put precision around that because there's always a chance that a, um, a sample may not be representative of the population. So now we look and we see that our allowance for sampling risk is 3.7%. So you take that 1% deviation rate plus the allowance for sampling risk, that puts a precision. And in auditing, you know, if we're talking about predicting the outcome of an election. They always sit there plus or minus 3%, whatever. In auditing, we're worried for our test of controls, for our attribute sampling, we're worried about how high it could go. So we only look at the upper end of that precision and we sit there and say well our allowance for sampling risk is 3.7 one plus 3.7 is what 4.7 percent that exceeds the tolerable rate the auditor would say that control does not have operating effectiveness and the response would be to look for a compensating control that would compensate for the one that just failed the test or we will alter the timing extent and nature of my substantive procedure, nature, more effective procedures such as external evidence, extent, larger sample sizes for my uh, substantive testing timing. I'll probably do my testing at year end. Now, not contemplated in this question, but what if the tolerable deviation rate was 6%? My sample deviation rate was 1%. My allowance for sampling risk was 37 so that's a 4.7 upper deviation rate. My what tolerable is six, then the auditor might conclude, okay, the control has operating effectiveness. And remember, tolerable deviation rate is associated with the assessment that you have made of the control risk. So although it's not written in literature, if you have an assessment of control risk at low, when I say in literature, I mean, there are books, textbooks and stuff like some of these behind me that would talk to you about um, tolerable deviation rates associated with different assessments of control risk, but it's not really standard. But some textbooks you see will say, well, if your tolerable deviation rate is between zero and uh, is at low, if, if you assess your control risk at low, then your tolerable deviation rate should be zero to three percent. If your um, assessment of your control risk is medium, then your tolerable deviation rate could be between four and seven percent. And then they'll say, if you set your control risk at high, well, then you're probably not going, you're not going to test the controls and you have really no tolerable deviation rate. You don't worry about it at that point because you're not going to be testing the controls. Okay. All right, good. Come over and let's take a look. In non-statistical sampling, the test of controls increased the desired confidence level results in a what? In a larger sample size. If you want to be more confident about your conclusions, then you need a larger sample size. And remember, we went through that table in the lecture for chapter eight, where we said, okay, if my uh, confidence level is 5%, then what? Then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to... Um, um, I'm going to want to be 95% confident 
I'm going to look at so many items, but if I go to a what 99% confidence level, 1% risk of assessing control risk too low, then I'm going to have to pull larger samples to be more confident in my um, in my conclusions. Uh, the risk of incorrect acceptance and the risk of over-reliance on the control, okay? Incorrect acceptance is what? Audit failure. I should have given a qualified opinion. I give what? I give a um, unqualified, unmodified opinion. So that's audit failure. If I do what? If I over-rely on the control, that means I assess the control risk what? too low, I over relied because the sample indicated me that the control had operating effectiveness when in fact it did not, then my audit is not going to be effective because in the case of this, um, incorrect acceptance, it's audit failure. That's how it's not an effective audit. But in the case of assessing control risk um, too low, then what? Then I have gone ahead and I have over relied on those controls. I haven't done enough substantive testing that would be warranted in the circumstances where the controls do not have operating effectiveness. Number 14, while performing a substantive test of detail during an audit, the auditor determined the sample results supported the conclusion that the recorded account balance was materially misstated. It was, in fact, not materially misstated. That is what? Incorrect rejection. You say, you know, these financial statements have a material misstatement, I have to modify the opinion. Well, you're incorrectly rejecting those statements based on your test that you use sampling for. Now, probably what's going to happen is management's going to come to you and they're going to say, well, what do you want us to do? What kind of adjustment do you want to make? You say, well, we'll have to look at that. You dig deeper and you find that there in fact was not a material misstatement. So what happens? You are not very efficient in how you go about your audit. You're probably effective and that you finally got to the right conclusion, but you did a bunch of additional work. Um, you know, you did some, I don't know about a bunch, but you did some additional work because your sample indicated that the financial statements were materially misstated when they in fact were not. That is the risk of incorrect uh, rejection. Incorrect acceptance is the other side of that coin. Your sample indicated that there wasn't a material misstatement when there was. The audit is not going to be effective. Assessing control risk too high means you thought the control did not have operating effectiveness based on the sample when in fact it did. You looked at 100 time cards and you found four that weren't signed. You said, oh, I can't tolerate that. That means the control does not have operating effectiveness. Meanwhile, you were so unlucky that in your sample of 100 out of 10,000 time cards, you found the only four that weren't signed. So the control probably had operating effectiveness. You assess control risk too high. So what happens? You then had to alter the timing extent and nature of your substantive procedure. You used what? Nature, external evidence instead of internal, effect, um, 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 extent, excuse me. You did what? You used larger sample sizes for your substantive testing. You did your testing at year end. So you were not very efficient in that case. Assessing control risk too low. Now, based on the sample, I determined that the control had operating effectiveness when in fact it did not. I should have what? Increased my substantive testing, nature, extent, timing. Instead, I didn't alter my substantive testing accordingly. And so I have increased the chance that I will miss a material misstatement. My audit is not going to be as effective. Okay. Notice, guys, a lot of this is coming from, and I'm almost tempted to open that. Why don't I do that? Probably would have helped if I would have opened that sooner, but that's okay. We'll get there. Uh, I think it's actually in another place. One second. <laughs> it's going to play hide and seek for me. There it is.
So I'm just showing you a slide here that will really help. And a lot of this information I'm taking from these questions come from chapter eight and then some from chapter nine. But this right here, okay, this thing that I went through in chapter eight with you is really where a lot of those questions are coming from. So you master this thing, you can answer a lot of those questions, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's keep looking now at the next one. Okay, which of the following sampling uh, factors would influence the sample size for substantive test of details for specific account and what? The expected amount of misstatement. The more misstatement you expect, the larger your sample size is going to have to be for your substantive test. And that's getting us more into chapter nine there. But if you expect misstatement, you're going to have to do more work in your sample, larger sample size to find those misstatements that you expect. So you know what the correct balance should be and whatever adjustment it is that you end up asking for in that case. Number 16, a number of factors influencing sample size for substantive test of details and account balance all other factors being equal, which would lead to a larger uh, sample size and what measure of a smaller measure of tolerable misstatement. If I tell you that a $2 error could cause the financial statements to be materially misstated, then I'm going to have to look at a lot of items to sit there and find those misstatements, right? Because they're very small. It's like trying to find the needle in the haystack, right? If I tell you that, you know, a $2 million error would cause the financial statements to be misstated and the company doesn't have a lot of $2 million transactions, then I don't have to take as big of a sample to try to find those big old errors. Okay. So the, uh, the, uh, um, thing that will lead to larger sample sizes, sm smaller measure of tolerable misstatement. Greater reliance on internal control. If I can rely on the internal control, I can have a smaller sample for my substantive test. Greater reliance on analytical procedures. Well, okay, sample size for substantive tests. So there's two ways to do your substantive testing through test of details in which we use sampling and through analytical procedures. And if I'm using more analytical procedure, then I don't have to take as big of a sample for my test of details, okay? So that's going not to lead to a larger sample, it would lead to a smaller sample. Smaller expected frequency of misstatements. Uh, if I don't expect a lot of misstatements, then I don't have to have as big a sample size to find them, okay? But smaller measure, of tolerable misstatement. I'm saying a $2 error can cause the financial statements to be materially misstated. I need a larger sample size to allow me to identify those. Number 16, uh, 17, which of the following is most likely to be detected by an auditor's review of an entity sales cutoff? Okay, so now we're getting into chapter 10 a little bit, okay, and the revenue auditing. And we're starting to talk about, well, what are we trying to do with cutoff? Cutoff is a financial statement assertion, remember. And we are simply saying, did we record something in the right period? So we'll look at transactions close to year end to see if they were reported in the current period that's uh, under audit or that new period that probably has already started as we're completing our audit. Um, you know, the year ends December 31st. We're doing our audit, what, probably in January or completing that audit in January, February of that next year. And so we'd want to pull some transactions from the end of the year under audit, say 2023. And we would also pull some transactions from, say, 2024 to make sure they were reported in the correct period. That is what? That is um, cut off. And so when we look... We're not looking at excessive discounts. We're not looking at unauthorized goods returned for credit. We're not looking for lapping of year-end accounts receivable. Remember, lapping is when a company, uh, an employee of a company does what? Steals the money and then hides that theft with a later receipt, okay? Cutoff wouldn't help you, help you with that. Unrecorded sales for the year, you know, the company, what? The company maybe records a sale from year one, 
2023, let's say, they record that in year two, 2024, and you think, well, why would they do that? That's understating income and sales for year uh, one, but maybe they feel that they have enough sales for year one, 2023 in this example, and they want to push some of that into 2024. So we would do a cutoff test. We'd look at transaction near year end to see that they have put that in their correct accounting period. That addresses the cutoff assertion. Let's take a look at the next one. An auditor should perform analytical procedures to substantiate the existence of accounts receivable when we are supposed to uh, use confirmation for accounts receivable. So we send out a confirmation to our client's customer asking them, do you owe? And if it's a positive confirmation, we're asking them to say whether or not they owe, say, $25,000, whatever it is. Well, if the customer doesn't reply, the client's customer does not reply to us, we will try to get a reply from them. In the event that we don't get a reply, we could use an alternative procedure, for example, an analytical procedure that will help us to substantiate that the account receivable balance is fairly stated. So even though the standards tell you, you know, you should confirm accounts receivable, you are allowed in certain circumstances to perform an alternative procedure to get to uh, evidence to support whatever assertion you're looking at. In that example of confirmation, we'd be looking at the existence assertion for accounts receivable. In general, revenue is recognized. Guys, this is more of an accounting question. We recognize revenue when it is earned, right? So you know, something the auditor has in their mind, um, you know, when they're doing a test is the revenue earned and they're looking for evidence of that, but that's really more of a, an accounting question. Um, tracing bills of lading to sales invoices. Okay, what's going on here? Bills of lading are like a packing slip in which it lists the things that are in that shipment. Okay, that's a bill of lading. So what are we going to do? We're going to look at bills of lading that list things that were shipped, and we're going to see, is there a sale for that? Well, when you go from supporting documents like bills of lading, and you go ahead and you take that back to sales invoices, and then you take those sales invoices back to the accounting records, that is a test of what? Completeness. For completeness, we go from the supporting documentation to the recording in books of original entry, say a sales journal, right? In the case of existence, we do what? We start with the recording in the sales journal and we go and find the supporting documentation. So now we would go the other way and look for the invoice and the bill of lading to see if something that was recorded in the sales journal, the goods actually got shipped. For the other way, for completeness, we sat there and said, well, we know that they shipped these goods. Was it properly recorded in the sales journal? We would work our way back to the sales invoice and ultimately to the uh, sales journal. So it provides evidence that what? Shipments to customers were billed, included in the sales journal. Our sales are complete. Okay. Okay, good. Um, recorded sales were shipped, that would be going the other way, right? Uh, build sales were shipped, again, that's going the other way, okay? We know they were shipped. We want to know where they build and where they ultimately recorded the sales journal. Properly authorized, that's what, that is a substantive test. I mean, excuse me, an attribute test, that's a control test, so that wouldn't even be relevant here. 21, tracing copies of a sales invoice to shipping documents. Now, um, that is a variation of what I just uh, asked you. First, we asked you bill of lading over here uh, to the um, bill of lading to the sales invoices. Now, in this next question, 21, we're looking at sales invoices and we're taking them to what? Uh, to the shipping documents, this is getting to what? The existence assertion. So the build sales were shipped. If something was billed, was it shipped? That gives us evidence that what? That that revenue was earned and should have been included in the sales journal. Of course, we would need to look at shipping terms. Um, if it's free on board um, 
destination, then we would be interested in well, when were the goods received by the client's customer. If it was free on board shipping point, we could stop there and say, okay, this was properly booked as a sale um, because we have a sales invoice and we see that sales invoice is recorded in the sales register and we see that there's a shipping document associated with that. 22, an auditor tests the entity's policy of obtaining credit approval. Okay, what assertion are we testing? Well, if we're looking to see that before our client will allow uh, folks to receive goods or services on account, meaning they're going to pay later, we would want to see that they do a credit authorization first. If they do a credit authorization, that means that what they're showing is account receivable, they probably have a pretty good chance of collecting that. So now what happens? Now we don't have to spend as much audit resource looking at the allowance for doubtful accounts because it's not as critical that they get that amount right because we know that they have good control procedures that are going to allow them to collect. So maybe we'll do some quick analytical. We'll probably do some recalculation of what they put in the allowance. We'll be satisfied that they put enough in the allowance and we don't have to spend a lot of audit resources on auditing that allowance. Why? because we had a good internal control and we had a good internal control over what? Over the valuation assertion associated with that account receivable because account receivable minus the allowance gives us the net receivable. If we're comfortable that the allowance is correct, we are comfortable that what? The valuation of the account receivable is correct, okay? So we're looking at the valuation assertion there. Notice how we line up what? Controls and audit procedures with the assertion, right? Control procedures and substantive procedures, we line those up with the assertion. 23, which of the following tested controls most likely would help assure an auditor that goods shipped were properly billed? And what are we going to do? We have the goods are shipped. We see the shipping documents. We take the shipping document. We find the sales invoice. We go and we look in the sales register to see that indeed those have been entered into the sales register. We are getting assertion, assurance, I should say, around the completeness assertion on that. For existence, again, go the other way. Uh, test designated to detect credit sales made after year end that have been recorded in the current period, that's cut off. Now we're talking the other way. What happened? They sat there and they recorded a sale that happened in year two and they recorded in year one. They may be trying to pad their year one revenue. Maybe they weren't satisfied that they're meeting some projections or something. So they put something that really happened in year two. They put it in year one. That's a cutoff procedure. We will look at transactions near year end to see that they have been recorded in the proper period. 25, unrecorded liabilities. If something is unrecorded, are the records complete? No. If something is unrecorded, that is a way of saying that the completeness assertion has a misstatement. Something's not recorded, the records are not complete. Okay, so unrecorded liabilities are most likely found during the review. And by the way, guys, uh, unrecorded liabilities were probably now starting to get um, more into uh, chapter um, 11, 12, where we start talking about the purchasing cycle. Okay, but unpaid bills, unpaid bills or liabilities, unrecorded liabilities, um, unpaid bills is the answer. Unrecorded liabilities are most likely to be found during the review of which of the following unpaid bills, unrecorded liabilities, right? Shipping records, bills of lading, unmatched sales invoices are not going to deal with liabilities, right? So you would come in and you would look and you'd say, well, gee, you've got these outstanding bills that you haven't paid for some time. What's going on? And you would look to see that maybe there's some unrecorded liabilities. Um. <clears throat> Yeah, let's take a look at the next one to determine whether accounts payable are complete. Again, for revenue, for assets, we're probably worried about the existence assertion. For liabilities, we're worried about the completeness assertion. What happens? If I don't record all my liabilities, what does that mean? 
that means that I'm overvaluing the company. If I'm overvaluing the company, right? Assets minus little liabilities equals stockholders equity. If I'm showing too much equity, I'm overvaluing that company. Now, a potential user of those financial statements can say, well, I was harmed because I made an investment based on what I thought about the equity of this company and the equity was overstated because you didn't detect unrecorded liabilities. So we are worried about the completeness assertion for liabilities, existence assertion for assets, because if they overstate their assets or they list assets that aren't even existing, then what? Then we're in a situation where, again, we have overstated the value of the company and a uh, potential investor can say that they were harmed by the fact that we missed that. So if we're looking to see whether accounts payable are complete, an auditor performed test to verify all merchandise received, the population documentation for the test um, consists of, and we look at the receiving reports. If you receive those goods, then in most cases, I can't really think of one in which you wouldn't. If you receive those goods, you should what be recording the appropriate liability for a payable on that, right? So we take those receiving reports and we look to see that they had recorded the liability for that, okay? Payments of, of vouchers, um, you know, payment of voucher means that they reduced the liability. So payment of a voucher isn't going to get to the idea of them being something that wasn't complete. If they paid it, then they should have taken the um, liability off the records, should have debited the liability, credited the cash. Purchase requisitions, looking at that, um, yeah, purchase requisitions, I probably would want to look at any open purchase requisitions because maybe they did receive the goods and they didn't put down that they received the goods. So I probably would do some work around purchase requisitions if there's an open purchase order. But right now, um, the best uh, way to verify that merchandise received is recorded. So just because you ordered it doesn't mean it was received. But I would do some work over open purchase orders for things that haven't been received yet to see uh, maybe they did receive them, right? But if I'm looking to see the merchandise received, I'd look to the receiving reports to see that the liability is there. Vendors invoices, again, I probably would be interested in unpaid vendors invoices to take a look to see what's going on with those. But again, the vendor could have invoiced uh, the client before the goods were actually received. That can happen. And so the best piece of evidence here, the key word up in the stem of the question is received, would be the receiving reports. So that's kind of a tricky question because it's all around what liabilities and payments for liabilities and ordering goods. And there are documents in there that you probably would do some procedure over there. But what made the second one, the best choice here was that it said for merchandise received. Let's go ahead and take a look at a couple others. Again, we're now in chapters, um, you know, 11, 12, 13 now. Okay. But let's take a look. An important primary purpose of an honors review of an entity's uh, procurement system would be to determine the effectiveness of the activities to protect against what? unauthorized persons issuing purchase orders, okay? We want to make sure that the procurement system has a purchasing agent who can what? Who can issue those purchase orders. And there should probably be a requisition that comes from the department in need to the purchasing department. Remember we said what? Different departments for different functions. So the authorization function over the ability to purchase something would come from, would be embodied in the purchasing department, okay? So we don't want unauthorized person issuing purchase orders. Think about it. If you're the head of the IT department, you may have a chummy relationship with some sort of computer vendor. Well, this is where we start to get the kickbacks where the person says, well, you know, we're going to charge a lot, but you enjoy football, don't you? So we're going to get you some tickets to the football game and don't worry about the price. Well, we have a separate what purchasing department that's authorized to issue those purchase orders and they are evaluated on what on the fact that they get us a good price 
when we order goods. So they're going to tell the guy, well, hey, I don't care about no football tickets. I'm worried about my job. It's my job to maybe even take competitive bids to figure out what the best price is instead of just trusting you and your silly football tickets, right? Okay, so uh, we will, we want a separate purchasing department to be authorized to issue the purchase orders, okay? Improper materials handling is going to be a custody issue. Misposting of purchase returns is going to be what? That's a record keeping issue. Excessive shrinkage or spoilage of our inventory, that starts to get to what? A custody issue. So again, you see, we separate what authorization, which this question was asking about, from the record keeping from the custody of the actual asset. So we would look to see that the entity's procurement system should determine the effectiveness of activities to protect against unauthorized purchases. Now we have some sense that there's a control that will help to make sure that, and it's probably at that point, the uh, <clears throat> The, ex, um, the rights and obligations assertion that we're interested in, uh, rights and obligations is saying, hey, is the company truly obligated, correctly being obligated for things, okay? And if you have people that are ordering stuff for themselves and taking it home and whatnot, then the company isn't being properly obligated for its liabilities, so we would probably put, do a test to see that there's some controls that make sure that the company's properly obligated. That way we get some sense that the obligation assertion is fairly stated. So again, guys, I can point to any, I should be able to. An auditor isn't doing their job if they can't point to what assertion is being protected by, by a control and thus why they are testing that control and what assertion is in which we are uh, detecting a misstatement through a substantive audit procedure. That's what you're doing. You're looking for misstatements in the assertions when you do your substantive procedure and you're doing control procedure. When you're looking at control procedure and doing your test of the control, you're looking for a control that would have prevented or detected the misstatement in the assertion. As you move forward in your accounting, your auditing career, if you're doing an audit procedure and you don't know what assertion you're working on, you're not doing your work correctly because you need to know what it is that's going to cause a problem with a misstatement in the assertions and the financial statements. <clears throat> okay. Uh, test designed to detect purchases made before you're in. I think we already had this. Oh, this is the other way that have been recorded in the subsequent period. And again, sometimes students will say to me, well, why would they do that? Well, they would do that because maybe they think they have enough sales in the current year and they want to push and get a head start into the second year. That's why you do cutoff procedures, both of transactions before and after year end to see if they were recorded in the correct period. And this last one, the authority to accept incoming goods in receiving should be based on an approved purchase order. So in the receiving department, when they receive goods, they're going to get the purchase order. Now the purchase order that they get in the receiving department won't tell the quantity so that they actually have to count that, but there should be what? There should have been a purchase order that went to the shipping receiving department that is showing, hey, we're supposed to get 25 laptops or whatever it is. Um, but it won't, the the uh, the quantity on the version of the purchase order, purchase order, one goes to the vendor, one goes to the person who requested it, one goes to accounting, so they know that, hey, there's going to be, what, an invoice coming for this, and then one goes to the shipping and receiving department, and so that they know that the thing was properly ordered when they get it, but the one that goes to the shipping department doesn't show the number so that they get a good count of what came in so that, that we know that we will only ship what we had actually ordered so that the shipping department will count it. If it says, say, 30 laptops are supposed to come in and the person counts and there's 42 laptops, they'll probably steal those 12. They said, geez, the thing says there's only supposed to be 30. We counted 42. Let's check off that there were 30 and let's steal the other 12. So you don't put the quantity on the um, version of the purchase order that goes to the shipping department, but the shipping department does get a copy of the purchase order so that they know when the stuff is received, 
it was something that was properly ordered. They'll count that and then they'll send that information to the accounting department to let them know, hey, we received 30 laptops. The accounting department will look and say, okay, 30 laptops is what was ordered. 30 laptops is what was received. 30 laptops is what we got invoice for. Let's go ahead and let's pay that uh, invoice now. And then they would start to go through the payment of the payable. Okay. All right, guys. So good sample of questions from chapter eight, chapter nine, chapter 10, 11, 12, 13. I think you can see that understanding the assertions that are embodied in the financial statements, understanding the controls that will prevent or detect the misstatement, understanding the audit procedure that will detect the um, misstatement. That's what the auditor does, the controller thing the company does to prevent or detect the misstatement. The auditor tests those controls to see if they're effective in accomplishing that. But then the auditor will always do some substantive testing to see if indeed the controls worked. And that auditor would then be able to detect any misstatements themselves by doing that work. And the better the controls, the less of the substantive testing we have to do, right? But it all centers around the assertions. And then we use, going back to the beginning of the discussion here, we use what? We use sampling to make those determinations. We'll sample a set of documents to see that the controls have operating effectiveness. And that will tell us, hey, if they do, we don't have to do as much substantive testing, nature, extent, timing. If the controls don't seem to have operating effectiveness, we won't test them. Or when we test them, it turns out that uh, we use sampling and uh, we find out, hey, we determine that the, um, the um, deviation plus the allowance for sampling risk exceeds our tolerable deviation rate. We'll say the control does not have operating effectiveness and we will do more substantive testing. Okay, so that's the way that all ties together. Um, those are the type of multiple choice question you'll see on your exam. Um, you will not see 29, you'll see 20 questions of that nature. And then you will see one uh, more of like a sort of like on the CPA exam, they call them task based simulation. And what I'm going to do for that one, I'm just telling you now, I'm going to give you um, a set of circumstances and see if you know how that will affect sample size for my test of controls and for my substantive testing. Okay, so I would really focus for that question on the slides from chapter eight that talk about how various factors affect sample size. And I, I know I have that in here. It better be in here. Okay, this example here, where we talk about how the sample size, sort of these two slides together, maybe even this one, okay, uh, how we talk about various factors affect sample size for my attribute sampling, for my tested controls, and then I have something similar in the discussion from chapter nine for substantive testing. Okay, and that will be your um, 20th, uh, 21st question, 20 multiple choice questions and one format type question that I'll have you look at. Question. Okay, guys, if there's nothing else, then I think that's a good review um, for your uh, exam. So I'm going to go ahead and adjourn and um, we will see you next time, okay? Any questions?